Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming. I am uh, quite honored to be the first speaker in what I think is an extraordinary event here for Rochester. So what I'm going to tell you about today is that my book, the title of this book, a set of ideas, uh, The Constant Fire Beyond the Science Versus Religion Debate. And the versus is really the important part I want to address to you today. So I'm a scientist. I study star formation and how stars die also. And I would consider myself to be an atheist. I am you know, not a member of any particular religion, and I don't particularly you know, hold any idea about deity. However, throughout my life, as I'll explain, I've always had a strong interest in what I will call spiritual endeavor, which is a word I favor over religion as a way of thinking broadly about science and religion. So um, as a scientist, it can be very dangerous to talk about science and religion unless one stays to the script. And the first thing I want to talk about today is the idea of getting past that script. And what do I mean by that? Warfare. There's this idea that science and religion have always been at war and always will be at war. And that idea is sort of funny in some sense because the founders of science, the modern version of science 400, 500 years ago, were all deeply spiritual, deeply religious men and women who saw what they were doing as part of a way of honoring what they would have considered to be sacred. They may have been at odds with the religious institutions at the time, but they certainly saw internally what they were doing as part of an, uh, of an effort to honor their own sense of the sacred. So my first thing I want to say is that there's more, there's another way of talking, at least one way of talking, about science and religion that doesn't involve this metaphor of warfare, which is actually quite modern, only 100 years old or so. So what is the way that we're all used to talking about science and religion? It's an emphasis on results. In particular, it's an emphasis on a debate between creationism and evolution, right? So endlessly, when we think about science and, uh, and, science and religion, what we think about is this debate between uh, evolution and creationism, and it tends to sort of suck all the air out of the room. And so one of the first things I want to say is about this debate between evolution and creationism is get over it, okay? Um, you know, enough already with the evolution and the creationism, okay? You know, you can no more do without uh, evolution as part of the body of science than you can do without um, aerodynamics. So if you don't believe in, in evolution, then don't fly in airplanes, okay? Uh, but at the same time, at the same time, scientists who see creationism and its adherents as defining what religion means or defining what human spiritual aspiration means are taking far too narrow a view, okay? Many times I think in, from the science side what we have is a, a sort of a reaction to whatever religion we grew up with or a reaction to, you know, the proponents of creationism and we miss this broad, powerful human phenomena that goes back 50,000 years. And so we have to take that into account. Uh, the, the, the entirety of human spiritual longing when we're thinking about any active parallels with what happens in science. OK, so if we're looking for new ways of thinking about science and religion, and I did some you know, research, I spent some time reading the canon of religious studies, um, what I found is there's a particular category which is quite useful, which is religious experience. Right? When we focus on religious experience and what people think is happening there, we're not thinking about creed or dogma or doctrine, which are particular to particular religions. And if we want to think broadly, we have to think, we have to go beyond any particular religion. It can't be about Christianity or Hinduism or Islam. It's got to be about spiritual longing as a human phenomena and how that connects with what happens in science. Um, religious experience is a useful way of thinking about this. And in a, the United States, we're lucky to have this tradition of really creative and innovative thinking about both science um, and spiritual endeavor in people like Thoreau and Emerson, and in particular, William James. William James is one of the founders of modern psychology. He was called the adorable genius by his contemporaries because he was just so willing to entertain different ideas. Um, he was so broad in his thinking. And in 1902, he wrote a beautiful book called On the Varieties of Religious Experience. And it's still a vivid read today, even 100 years later. And in that book, he focused, again, not on ideas about deity and what God can do on Thursday and can't do on Friday. That was not his interest. He was interested in the personal response to the world and how we encounter the world and how, in responding to its beauty and its power, um, we have these, this, this sense of the world. And from this, he came, uh, derived a definition of religion, which is quite different. I want to read it to you now. Religion, he said, shall mean for us the feelings, acts, and experiences of individual men in their solitude, so far as they apprehend themselves to stand in relation to whatever they may consider to the divine. Okay? So it's really, it's a definition of religion that starts in here. And I think in that way, if we begin there, we can bring or think about science and spiritual endeavor in a way that brings them into an active complementarity. Okay? 
Because as a scientist, what I want to do is preserve the integrity of the sci of scientific practice while acknowledging what it draws from, okay? while acknowledging what draws me and other scientists to science. So I hope you've all had experiences of what he's, uh, the kind that James is talking about. But if not, I want to give you one example. This is from Daniel Quinn, who wrote the book Ishmael, a very popular book in the 1990s. And uh, Quinn, for a little while, was a Trappist monk for about a year. And he had this experience where he was working in the monastery gardens, and he went in to get a bunch of uh, garden tools. And as he walked out, he had this experience. Let me read it to you. I turned and faced the sunshine, and the breath went out of me as if someone punched me in the stomach. That was the effect of receiving this sight, of seeing the world as it is. I was astonished, bowled over, dumbfounded. I could say that the world was transformed before my very eyes, but that wasn't it, and I knew that wasn't it. The world hadn't been transformed at all. I was simply being allowed to see it the way it is all the time. I, not the world, was transformed. Everything was burning. Every blade of grass, every single leaf of every tree was radiant, was blazing, incandescent with a raging power. I hope you've all had experiences like this in some form or another. They help define our lives. They set our lives in motion. And I've had many experiences like this. And the joke of my life is they've all been through the lens of science, whether it's through mathematics, uh, whether it's through the Hubble Space Telescope images of a star-forming cloud, or the narratives of star formation and stellar death. I've had many of these experiences. And I'm not alone. If you look at the world's literature of scientists describing science, you'll find that often they had experiences like this. It's what drew them to science in the first place. So experience is a different way of thinking about what happens in science for scientists and the rest of us uh, you know, and, and everyone else, as well as what happens individually in religion. So now, um, in thinking about what this is pointing to, one has to use words, right? And as an atheist, God is not going to be a word um, is going to be useful to me. If other people, if it's useful to other people, that's fine. But what I was looking for was a word that didn't have any particular connotation to any particular religion around now. So that's why the word sacred, I think, is very important. It's a very useful way of thinking about life and our response to it. Now, the word sacred, a lot of scientists might say, oh my god, use the word sacred. You can't do that. You know, you're a scientist. And I understand why they have that reaction, because you're afraid that it'll be called into service about some idea of deity that somehow will then be pushed against uh, the naturalistic explanations of science. But the word sacred, actually, you don't really have to worry about that problem unless you're a member, you know, citizen of the Roman Empire. Because sacred actually refers to Roman temple architecture. The sacer was the interior of a Roman temple. And when you were in the interior, when you were in the sacer, you had to be attentive. And that's the key word, attentive. It's about attention. You have to be attentive to the, the quality of life which stands out from the profane. The profanum was the outside of the temple. That's where you could do whatever you want. You could sell your walnuts, your Grateful Dead t-shirts. You know, you didn't, it was just everyday life. And so the idea that there is the sacred, which is our response to the world when it stands out on its own, when the world is self-luminous and calls to us in a way above our every day-to-day -day concerns of just using the world, okay? That is what the sacred refers to. Now, there is a, an important scholar of religion, Mircea Iliade, who was the great doyen of the Chicago School of Religion, who thought a lot about the sacred and the profane and how the two fit together. And he came up with a word which I like quite a bit and lean on quite a bit. So we all know about epiphanies, having an epiphany. But he spoke about horiphanies. And a horiphany was the time and space, the location and time and space, when the sacred erupts into our lives. Right? It can be you know, when you're just walking down the street and you're you know, enmeshed in your thoughts and suddenly you know, the flight of a bird across the sky will catch your attention and you're gripped for that moment, pulled out of your day-to-day -day concerns. Um, can happen in many different ways. So for him, he, this was a horiphany. And they defined for him the entire history of human religious longing. Okay? And what I come to understand in time is that actually this is what science is all about as well. You walk by the, uh, you know, the ant colony every day, you never notice it. And then one day you stop to notice the activity, the thousands of ants all milling about, and you consider it worthy of study. You consider it worthy of your attention. So the, uh, one of the things I really would like you to get out of this talk is the idea that science offers us horiphanies. Right? Science, in its practice and its fruits, so its practice for those of us who are scientists, and its fruits for you know, what is brought to the culture as a whole, at, manifests horiphanies for us and acts as a way of opening up, it's a gateway to an experience of life's sacred character. Now, we don't usually think of science this way, right? We're actually taught not to think of science this way. 
But that's really a mistake. We're cutting ourselves off at the knees when we do this, right? Many of you, I'm sure, have seen NOVA programs or IMAX programs, you know, which start with some beautiful orchestral score telling the story of the universe. And you have this response. This, you know, you're called to something. But then, you know, we scientists often say, oh, no, no, that response has nothing to do with anything spiritual or anything sacred. Right? But what we need to recognize and remember is that science plays this role, and the impulse to science has always played this role. <coughs> so this image I'm showing you of a Hubble Space Telescope, a Hubble Space Telescope image of a star forming region, or the nerve cell, both of these, when we consider them, when we're open to them, can act as gateways to that experience, that very special experience of the world, when the world speaks to us directly in some sense. Now, I have a picture here of uh, Paleolithic cave art up there, because you're all familiar with this with art, right? When you go into a museum, it's quiet. You, know, you, you expect to have a reaction to the art that calls something out of you, right? You expect, you hope to have an experience of the art that, that calls to this quality of the world, this attentiveness to the world. And my argument is that science does this as well. Now, by playing this role, science is actually recapturing something very ancient in us. And that's why, again, when we think about religion, or we think about human spiritual endeavor, we have to think over 50,000 years since the dawn of our consciousness. Um, because we have always told stories. We have always told narratives that set us into context with the universe. And those were mythologies. People think of myth as being often a false story, but that's not true. Myths or mythologies are sacred narratives that help us understand who we are, where we are, and what it is we're supposed to be doing here. And in that way, science plays a role of recapturing or recovering um, the role of myth for us moderns. Okay? So science and myth are connected because the narratives of cosmology, the birth of the universe, which is strange stories of the origin of space and time, the birth of life, of life starting from non-life in puddles of warm water in the early earth, the stories of human evolution, of, you know, uh, of, of apes that slowly grew to understand the world in a deeper sense, all of these are sacred narratives that call us out of our ordinary experience. They're told in the language of science, the very particular, very important investigative technique of science, but what they, on the largest level, they call to us, they call out to us to have this experience of the world on its own terms. So the important thing here is that science's roots in myth reveal finally, I think for me, the connections with ongoing spiritual endeavor. And what I mean by that is, so I have a picture here of Stonehenge, right? And Stonehenge was clearly a place of religion, right? That's where there were all kinds of rituals uh, that were enacted there. We don't know what most of them are. They're too old. Um, but we also know that Stonehenge was built in ways that were aligned. They were clearly, its builders were very aware of astronomical motions of the sky. So there's all kinds of alignments uh, uh, with the, the rising and setting of the sun, etc. So early on, the imperative that became science and the imperative that became modern spiritual endeavor were wedded together. And only later on did they separate out. And it was very important for science for it to be separated out so that the <coughs> investigative techniques and the integrity of science could be maintained. But we have to remember where it came from and how that aspiration, and that's a key word, how the aspiration that comes from our fundamental experience of life's other quality, its, its non-profane quality, how that aspiration can lead us to effort. It could lead us effort in a uh, spiritual endeavor or it can lead us in effort in science. Now, you know, when I give these talks, a lot of times people say like, yeah, 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 great. Cut to the chase, does God exist? You know? And so, you know, this idea of transcendent realities. And, and, and what I want to say about this is like, look, we're going to argue about this forever. If you believe in God, you know, you're going to believe in God. If you don't believe in God, you don't believe in God. It doesn't, you don't have to answer the question of whether the, of the existence of transcendent realities to, for science to be recognized as a means to apprehend the sacred. Look, by its very nature, transcendent realities are transcendent. And so this, I think this dialogue or this, or, uh, this conversation, this argument is going to go on forever. It doesn't have to be answered for us to understand the roots of science in our long history of, of awareness and self-awareness. Now, another thing that happens to people like, oh, yeah, great, big deal, science and religion, it's an academic exercise anyway, how does it affect me? Well, the, uh, the, the uh, brute fact, I think, that we all face uh, in this room is that we have about 100 to maybe 200 years to figure out the project of civilization and see whether it can, in fact, be sustainable. We are at a crossroads. We run into an era of limits, both because of climate change and because of resource depletion on multiple levels. Now, certainly, we're in this position because of science and technology, right? Climate change comes about because we've been burning CO2 in so many different ways. Um, and clearly, the solutions that we uh, come up with are certainly going to involve science and technology as well. But that's not only it, right? The solutions are going to have to play into what we value. The 
which technologies and which science we deploy to deal with this enormous problem, to marshal our creative forces, to marshal our activities, are going to depend on what we value and what we hold to be sacred. And in that way, understanding the relationship between science and spiritual endeavor is going to be crucial, or else we're not going to be able to marshal the entire population of the planet to move in a one direction or at least you know, a few directions to deal with this issue. So we can no longer separate science out from the other parts of human culture in a world that's been pushed to the limits of its carrying capacity. So along those lines, um, let me bring you this quote, science and technology revolutionize our lives, but memory, tradition, and myth frame our response. This is from Schlesinger, the great uh, historian. So that's really what I want to emphasize. If I could leave you with anything, is the sense that where we are now is we must integrate science into the whole, the totality of human experience because we live in a world that is saturated with both the fruits and the poisons of science. So really what matters now is placing science in its proper human context. And I thank you very much.